Hey guys, today we're gonna be watching a video from Professor John Lennox, world-renowned mathematician, and he's gonna be talking about the age of the earth and this common question that people ask and how to reconcile that idea with biblical scriptures. You ready? I'm ready, let's dive in. <laughs> okay, well, you notice, and this is why it's helpful to collect questions. There are three questions out of the seven on the same topic, did you notice that? And they're all about the age of the Earth. Do you want to know how old the Earth is? It's quite a bit older than me. <laughs> so let's have a look at this, because it bothers many people. And I want to say unnecessarily so. I gave a speech at my old school two weeks ago. And my old school, I must confess this at the beginning, you see, and you'll see why in a moment. My old school was founded by an archbishop and a mathematician. The archbishop's name was Usher. And he calculated the age of the earth. Well, he wrote to the vice chancellor of Cambridge University a letter, a famous letter. And he said, dear sir, I have worked out that Adam was born at 9 o'clock on the 5th of October, 4004 BC. I am sorry that I cannot give any more precise information than that. <laughs> and that has gone down in history as Archbishop Usher's Young Earth Chronology. Now, I was standing beside his successor, who is the chairman of the governors of my school. And I turned to him and I said, Sir, Usher was a historian and so were you. Now, Usher's interesting because Many people laugh at his calculation. What they don't know is that both Newton and Kepler made an almost similar calculation in that time. We never hear of that. And, but I said to the Archbishop, Your Grace, he was sitting here, I, I said, I suspect you probably reckon the Earth and the universe are about seven orders of magnitude older than that. But I said, whatever the answer to the question is, we must not forget that he got one thing absolutely right. And that is there was a creation. Now, the most important thing about this is not when it happened, not even how it happened, but that it happened. And you know, it took centuries before people came to it. I was at Cambridge in the 1960s, not the 1860s, <laughs> the 1960s, when the first evidence, really strong evidence from the microwave background came in that the universe was a finite age. Do you know, many people today don't know, that the scientific establishment resisted that fiercely. The chief editor of Nature, the world's most famous scientific magazine at the time, a man called Maddox, said we shouldn't go down this line that there was a creation at a finite time in the past. Quote, it gives too much leverage to people that believe the Bible. That is one of the most significant scientific discoveries of the 20th century was resisted because it paralleled what scripture said. Now come to the 21st century, and I was in a very prestigious gathering of physicists, philosophers, and so on. And I was the token Christian. And I was asked to say something about this. And I got up and said something about creation. And I was heckled. A leading scientist stopped me dead, and he said, Professor Lennox, stop. You are joking. I hope you're joking. If you suggest the Bible has anything to say to us in the 21st century. Wow. I said, I wasn't joking. In fact, I said, it's interesting. Of course, the Bible isn't a textbook of science. I don't teach algebra from Leviticus, and I never will. <laughs> but it does talk in certain places about exactly the same physical universe that scientists study. In the beginning, God created 
the very heavens and earth that you study. And not only that, it's got the idea, which is very new in terms of science, that creation is finite backwards in time. There's a huge mathematical work been done on this that is very convincing. Now I said, I'm going to make a suggestion. If you, scientists, had not been so wedded to Aristotle and his eternal universe, you might just have looked more carefully to see if there was evidence of a finite age to the universe long before you did. And of course, that was a pretty devastating thing to say. But it's hugely important. It's the fact of creation. That is a finite time backwards. Now, does the Bible say anything about that? Now, of course, you can interpret the Bible as saying something about it. So I want to say something about this. You see, if we were having this evening lecture 500 years ago, that question would not have been asked. Not once, let alone three times. But I tell you what question would have been asked three times. Somebody would have stood up in each of the lines and said, Dr. Lennox, Dr. Tour, what are we to make about this crazy chap in Italy claiming that the earth moves <laughs> when the Bible says it doesn't? The earth is fixed on pillars, say the Psalms, so that it should not be moved. And this crazy chap is saying it does move. Now, help us to uh, really get a grip of the fact that it, it doesn't move. Uh, just let me ask you, how many of you in this audience believe the earth doesn't move against the background of the fixed stars? How many of you? Goodness, I, I thought I was in a place with some people who believed the Bible. <laughs> Now, this is very interesting, you see. You do believe that the earth moves, and yet the Bible says it doesn't. Now, how has that happened? It's happened because there was, first of all, Galileo, the first moving earther, and everybody else was a fixed earther. The philosophers, the Aristotelians, plus the Catholic Church. But then there were one or two more moving earthers as they began to be convinced. And now the whole lot of you are moving earthers. <laughs> but you haven't necessarily given up your conviction that the Bible is true. Why? Because we can see that when the Bible speaks about the earth being fixed, it's not talking about being geometrically or spatially fixed. It's talking about something much deeper, and that is stability. The, and the Bible refers to this. He's made summer and harvest. They're fixed things, and they depend. The stability of the Earth and its orbit, for example, depends on gas giants and inverse square law of gravity and everything else. And we're happy with that. But for centuries, it was difficult. Now, come with me if you can. It seems to me a very similar thing is happening with your question. You can believe, if you want, that the Bible says the earth doesn't move. You can believe it, but you don't have to. Now, I want to argue briefly that you can believe that the earth is young and the universe is young, but you don't have to because the Bible doesn't claim it. Now, let me try and establish that briefly. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then you have a sequence of days. Remember that? Six days and a day of rest. Now, here's the interesting thing. In the Hebrew language, the first statement in the beginning were the heavens and the earth, and the earth was this and that, is made in one Hebrew past tense. The tense changes to another past tense for the description of the days. You can establish that. I asked, to be fair, the professor of Hebrew at Oxford and the professor at Cambridge, and they agreed amazingly that this is what it says. Now, what does that mean? Well, Professor Jack Collins, who uh, was a scientist and is now the chief translator for the English Standard Version of the Bible, which you may be aware of, says, I quote, it means that the first statement occurs at an indefinite period before the second. 
What does the Bible say about the age of the universe and the earth? Absolutely nothing. So why fight about it, folks? What do you think? I was raised under some hardcore creationist. Young earth. Young earth creationist and dispensationalist, I might add, if you know if that means anything to anybody, uh, teaching. And that is really hard for me to let go of. Mm. And, um, but I will say the, the greatest thing that it bred in me for sure was to take the Bible very seriously. That in the balancing act that he talks about with um, the earth moving or, you know, the heavens moving, in the balancing act of science in the Bible, you never swing all the way so that the Bible means nothing. The Bible has to mean something by what it says. It doesn't mean nothing. Um, So when it says the earth is fixed, it means something. And to accept that it means that there's stability and that it's not going to be this grand upheaval of nature all the time, uh, we can accept that. But at least it means that. God is really saying something intelligible about yeah. the way that the earth is. And so so I appreciate that he he takes God created the heavens and the earth, that it does say something intelligible about science, that the heavens and the earth have a creation, a finite in time backwards creation moment. And the distance in time between that point and where we are now, um, I, I guess I will concede. Yeah, he's right. I you know it's inconsequential to the truth of the Bible. Like this isn't a determining factor. And I thought it was fascinating and I would love to hear what you think about it, about how the atheistic scientists at the time of this discovery that there was a finite beginning to the universe, it was such pu- it was pushed back on so much because it seemed to agree with believers in the Bible too much. And so to me, this discussion really isn't like he concludes here. Why are we fighting about it? It doesn't necessarily like, I don't know if I take one stance to the other. I, I am sympath, uh, sympathetic to both really because like, like you said before uh, we decided to have this discussion is I don't know if I have studied all of those facts as much as something like the resurrection of, the G- of Jesus because they yeah. just don't matter to me as much. They're definitely not on the same plane of yeah. requirement, <laughs> like truth requirement. Yeah. Do I have to believe the resurrection of Jesus? Absolutely, that it was a real space-time history event. Do I have to believe you know, in the age of the earth as a real space-time history fact and get it nailed down? No. no. They're not on the same plane. And the point so, being that there seems to be a real definite beginning and the time period of that doesn't prove or disprove the Bible. And just because you believe in the Bible doesn't mean you necessarily have to be a young earth creationist. Mm -hmm. You do have to be a creationist, just not a young earth. one. (laughs) (laughs) I think, I think that's, I think that's appropriate is the, the truth of who God is, um, the Bible leans so heavily on the theological fact that he is a creator, that there was a creation moment and that he preceded that creation moment and that he's the Lord over everything that was made. And the flexibility of the means and what the video camera footage of that creation might have looked like, um, is flexible yeah and it's kind of like the question is the do you really believe the bible is literal and it's like that is such it's the worst question to anybody who understands literature if you are trying to make this literary piece of a historical work called the bible which is a, a library of different documents all collected into one and you're trying to study it like an evidential repeated experiments scientific method in that sense you're you're going to be disappointed yeah. because it's it's lit- it's lit- literature which has lots of different literary tools and different types of writings and poems and and it wasn't intended to be a scientific textbook and we all often want to fix 
we want to fit these ancient documents that are so rich and so core to the fundamentals of our society and and the the ideas of right and wrong and just everything we know and we're benefiting from especially in the west and we want to fit it into our very narrow uh proud view of the world very proud like hey we're we've come to a complete uh enlightenment of truth in being materialists and then look at what our worldview actually turns the world into it just turns it into dust because yeah. that's what materialism does it you know it takes meaning out of everything so yeah, it's just it does, like yeah. it's so ironic and and it often kind of goes back to that whole idea of their uh, uh in romans romans 8 i believe or romans 1 i can't remember but uh they suppress the truth and unrighteousness oh, yeah. it's like it's not necessarily that this truth isn't accessible to people it's just ignored or suppressed or i, I believe that that word for suppressed is like to hold under um kind of like taking a speaker i think we talked about this before taking a speaker and holding it under water so you don't have to hear it yeah i i'll just say i feel right now right now a huge tension in my life of listening to things like this clip and and other probably more modern apologists who I don't want to be uncharitable, you know, but but it does feel like sometimes you push the Bible into, you know, it's just literature and you have to understand its meaning and things like that. Right. And and I and I appreciate that. And I do think that it's true that and one of the reasons why we ask questions like this and we don't understand the Bible is because we're actually asking shallow questions. How old is the earth is actually a, is, is a shallow question in relationship to the deeper questions of Genesis one, like where do we come from? Who am I accountable to? What was I made for? What's my purpose in life? What is humanity capable of? Where should I learn what my destiny is and how, how can I guide myself through this complex thing called life? Those are actually hard questions that take a lot longer than a five-minute explainer video to answer. You know what I mean? And so actually to ask the age of the earth, while it feels like this huge question, and it might be a con contradiction, it shouldn't be a make-or-break contradiction, but it feels like a contradiction in a lot of people's minds. Um, it's more important to ask the real questions that cannot be answered in a five-minute explainer video that have to really be sat with and wrestled with and when you come to an answer f to those questions, they require real life change. You know what I mean? How old is the earth? That doesn't affect where I live, like, who I marry, what I do, yeah. what I think, you know, what I listen to, what I watch. Um, but these other questions about purpose, about meaning, about destiny, about origins, uh, those really affect life. And so those are the mm. deep questions that we should ask the Bible. But I don't want to say that the Bible is just speaking to those questions. I think it does have answers um, to all kinds of things because it's coming from God's heart. And so when he says something intelligible about the way that the universe is, I, I want to take that seriously too. Um, but I do want to ask the right questions about the Bible and, and put them all in the right order. You ask the right questions about the Bible first before you get to <laughs> yeah. the less consequential questions yeah. later. I think about when we approach these ideas in general and to answer these kind of curious questions that are on our mind, because I do think curiosity is a good thing and finding explanations is a good thing. You shouldn't just ignore something, a question that needs to be answered, but all of these questions should become, should be for the Christian should become, we, as, a, as believers, we should come to these questions with the, base understanding that the bible is true and if there seems to be a contradiction then there must be an explanation for why the bible is still true in the midst of this and i think even in the you know intertestamental period what these uh, certain rabbis and people would come to when working with this with these documents with this these truth texts uh, specifically the old testament is when they would come to a seeming contradiction they would get excited rather than 
we get discouraged because we're like, man, maybe my worldview is not true or maybe the Bible is not true. But they would get encouraged because they knew new revelation was around the corner. A new understanding of a nuance of the character of God was around the corner. Yeah. I think to take his example of saying the Bible has always said what it's always said forever. <laughs> well, you know, since it was written. Yeah. Um, and so to understand what the Bible is saying is is paramount. And right, then, like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah. That is a creation statement. The, the purpose of that is in the beginning, that there was a beginning God created. Yeah, and I... But even what I'm saying is internally to the mm-hmm. Bible itself is what is the Bible saying about what it's trying to talk about, which is God, origins, destiny, meaning, purpose, relationships, things like that. Um, and it does comment on science. And when it has uh, comments on science, you know, you've got these pillars, these waystones that just says, this is how it is. And science is always going to do like this, yeah. you know, for everything you can say, well, there's a new discovery around the corner. There's a new this, there's a new understanding. And science is always going to do this. And so I, I do want those, those monumental pillars of the Bible to, to stand firm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Like creation. Science doesn't hold each other, hold itself in tension. Like the Bible does the truth of the Bible. Like, like you said, this mosaic of truth and this tapestry of, of strings that just hold all of it into tension. If you pull one, it's going to pull on the other. Not all science does that. Not all science is that solid. Yeah. Science feels like waves crashing on a shore and constantly remaking it and Mm. refining and rediscovering and stuff like that. And so there, there really are almost two opposite shapes where the Bible is so complex, but it's stable. And you could spend all of your time digging into the complexity and trying to understand the complexity, but it's going to be stable. Hmm. And so better to understand with, with full open eyes the stability and the complexity of the Bible and let science do its thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, whatever it's going to do. And maybe one day the age of the earth will turn back around and there'll be a new fashion. You new know? discovery, yeah. And who, like literally <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Who knows? For every age, in one single generation, I'm sure people thought, we've done it, we've made it, yeah. we've gotten to, you know, these certain limits of science, and this is how the world works, but there's a new, there's a new day around the corner, and dark new discovery and all of it, yeah. So, better to look at the Bible in its complexity, but also stability, and try to understand what it's saying about itself, and, and what it's saying about what it's actually trying to talk about, um... And let science be what it's going to be. And yeah. and where they touch, we can have those intelligent conversations, and we should allow them to touch and comment on one another. Uh, but I think that the instability of science, yeah, that that should not be the, the staff we lean on. Well, the and, Bible should be the staff we lean and on. And it's easy to say day. science, but... There's so many different types of science. Exactly. That isn't necessarily like I set up an experiment in the lab and I test it. There's all different types of science. Just like, you know, I don't know if we should be necessarily making this science in general comparison to the Bible as much as we should be testing it with a historical lens. Right. Yeah, they're two totally different kinds of understanding. Yeah, we one is never... a philosophical, social science, even a spiritual understanding that you you cannot put a spirit, a human spirit, in a test tube. Yeah, a, a human spirit is not subject to repeatable experiments. I feel like I'm getting really excited yeah. and heated about this, <laughs> but but I feel like it's, you know what I mean? Um, well, things like we... things like divine healing. Yeah, uh, because divine healing. If we believe that divine healing is um, a gracious act by a person, you cannot put a personality through a repeatable experiment. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. cried at uh, at Sam and Frodo, you know, on the sides of Mount Doom, you know, blackened with Frodo and his finger gone. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, but you can't say like, okay, let's repeat that experiment and show you the same clip again. You're not going to get the same reaction out of me. You can't put a personality in a test tube and do a repeatable mm-hmm. experiment on it. So the Bible 
and and the God of the universe, who is the heart behind the Bible, you can't put that in a test yeah. tube with a repeatable experiment. There are totally different realms that you can't try to put them in the same categories. Yeah, I think, well, Linux, even earlier in this um, the video, if I'm not mistaken, talks about the idea of why does tea boil, you know? And he's like, you could take the scientific route where you go, well, when you get it up to this certain temperature, what happens is the pressure in the atmosphere, you know, and give it that explanation. But he's like, actually, the more right explanation is my wife wanted tea. That is why yes. water boils. That is why this water is boiling. Yes. Is because my wife wanted tea. Yes. I remember having a conversation with somebody. Dude, this is my wheelhouse right now. I'm so excited <laughs> about this. I remember having a conversation with somebody, and he was really, honestly, repeating to me what I learned in English classes and science classes and history classes in high school about mythology. Mythology is... Um, a reason when the, the for something not ex sorry explained when we look at stories of mythology people were making up scientific reasons for let's say why a lightning bolt was striking like because Zeus because threw Zeus threw it yeah. and that it was this gap in scientific knowledge that um that we can close now with science, and so we can take Zeus out of the picture. The god of the gaps kind of thing. Yeah, and so the more gaps we close, uh, the easier it will be. And so science will eventually overtake all of our explanations that right now we leave to God, and God will be out of the picture, right, so the why not throw reason, them out now? The whole reason of the Bible is just because people didn't have explanations to, of things at the time and didn't understand things. Yes, yeah. and and I had just read... Which isn't a, true. A, I had just read a book by G.K. Chesterton called... The Everlasting Man, and it is Love absolutely in one of my top five favorite books of all time. And what he makes so clear in that book is that um, the question that people are asking in mythology is actually not, why did the lightning bolt strike? Because there's a voltage differential in the clouds versus the ground, and you know there's an arc that yeah. releases that voltage differential. No, the, the question they're actually asking is, why did the lightning strike there? And the only way to answer that question is through through a personality, like purpose, design, reason. You can only answer those questions through a personality. And so he's saying that really the gods of mythology are not a gods of the gaps in science, but is trying desperately to assign personality to an otherwise impersonal <coughs> universe. Yeah. And and it, it was really amazing to watch him just fall silent. Yeah. Because. Um, what's so shallow about the question that materialists won't ask is that question. Why does the tea boil? And you immediately go to the materialist answer. And, and it's almost as though people have forgotten to ask the personal answer. Why is the universe here? Well, it's always been here. Or because of the Big Bang or because of evolution. Like, no, 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 no. But why? Yeah. And I think right now today is one of the times that people are craving that question the most yeah. out of anybody is is actually the personal why. And what's so brilliant, and I think that Christians need to catch up to this, is that that is the answer that the Bible, that's the question that the Bible is trying to answer. The Bible is not trying to ask the materialist, repeatable experiment, scientist why. You can leave that job to science, but the Bible is answering the personal why. And it's the one thing people are craving the most yeah. today. And so if we can use the Bible to, to wield it, to answer the question that it was made to answer and to answer the question that people are actually asking now more than ever, um, it's like we have yeah. the gold. We have it in our hands. And instead of tracing the rabbit on science type questions, use the Bible, the, the tool that it was yeah. for the job it was made for. Well, I just think of like you'll know the tree by its fruit and you just walk out the explanation of a worldview and where it leads you. And oftentimes you see these people that are answering the T question in that way have no deep personal relationships or in a deeply depressed and by themselves. And the people that answer it the other way and really believe that they're the, the universe is personal, they have the deepest relationships. Like we all have close, close friendships. And that's one of the things that we adore the most is like, the genuine, uh, genuine, 
personal brotherhood, friendships, relationships. Yes. And that's actually what gives us meaning is relationship. Even in, you know, science, relationship gives you meaning, at least in physics, it does. Mm -hmm. It gives you position, you know, it gives you value. And, and I really think sometimes those people are missing the, the real thing that gives them meaning in life in I, general. I don't, I don't want to slam, you know, lost people are lost. And so I don't want to slam them too hard, but, but I have noticed in evangelism, John Cena. <laughs> I have noticed in evangelism when I talk to somebody and I'll just, you know, you reach your hand out for a stranger and you st- try to start a conversation. I have noticed that when people um, will look me in the eyes, when they'll engage in a conversation, when they'll um, respond questions in kind. How are you doing today? Oh, how are you doing today? Uh, What do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? I have noticed the more personable people are, um, almost invariably, they are either Christians or they have a Christian background. They were raised Christian. Mm. And the people who are cold, who are impersonal, I have, I have just noticed, and I, you know, they're lost. And the reason why they're that way is because they're lost. And I, and so I don't want to come down on them too hard for being lost, but it's just true that something about the Christian worldview, about the value of other people, about the value of relationships, about the value of the personal, uh, the idea that persons will go on forever, that they're eternal beings. There's something about that worldview that, that changes you on a very deep level. And, and I can just tell. I can tell when I talk to people yeah. w- how much of that worldview they believe or don't believe. Yeah, and lastly, on the the topic of miracles, right? Like if creation itself is a miracle and 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 God is the God of miracles. And, he is a, and all of creation has a personal origin. Yeah, and to this idea of the God of the gaps, right, is that, well, because we couldn't explain it with science, we created the, the Zeus. And, and some of that might be true for mythology, but at least for the Bible, that's not the case for miracles. And you see that in the story of Mary and Joseph with the the uh, birth of Jesus because, you know, people at that time did know where babies came from. Oh, yeah, it's no mystery. <laughs> no mystery. They know that, you know. And, and Joseph was very aware of this, so much so that he wanted to divorce Mary quietly because he was a good man. And a, and, a, and a being, a spiritual being had to, an angel had to come and visit him to convince him otherwise to not do that. And he went along with it. And, and praise God he did. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, there's no God of the gaps there. Yeah. Well, I think that's the perfect example is that it is not a lack of scientific understanding that made Joseph have to juggle this idea. Um it came down to there's a personal reason. There was a personal intervention by a personal God who came down and did this activity. Yeah. And now there's a whole other issue of him trusting that person and saying, I'm going to participate in whatever plan you have for this child. That, and, and that makes him a righteous man. But the, the understanding that this activity that is miraculous, the source is a person, a person who yeah. is acting in history and can do things beyond my conception, but but it's his activity that is at work here. And it has nothing to do with a lack of science understanding, yeah. but everything to do with a personal worldview about what's out there and who's in charge and how things work, that at the back of all of it is is a person. Yeah, so to bring this all together, so we watched the clip from John Lennox that basically led us to the idea of like, what is the purpose of the Bible? What is the Bible actually trying to get at? And the purpose seems so much more personal, so much more uh, really different than these questions of how old the earth is and these more, what you'd say, you know, not unconsequential questions, not, you know, somewhat unconsequential <laughs> in some sense, but not meaningless questions and things that we should necessarily avoid, but maybe not what the Bible is intending to answer and even more so maybe not the most important thing that you should focus on right now, you know, and, and, and maybe focusing on those things might be leading you to a place where, uh, you're, 
you're disregarding some personal relationships in your life and and even specifically having a personal relationship with the creator himself yeah and which is accessible which is very accessible yeah um i think it is an often forgotten fact that the forefathers of scientific exploration like newton and kepler and I forget the guy's name. I think his name is Maxwell, who Mm. was studying electricity. Mm. Uh, Man, those guys were devout Christians. And their study of the impersonal universe came from a deep understanding that there is a personality behind that universe. I'm sorry. They understood that the universe was not impersonal, but Mm. that it is personal. It came from a personal mind. And their love for the world and their love for science actually went from Bible personal love of God to science. Yeah. And um, so we, it's not always helpful to ask hard, you know, contradictory questions the other way that the greatest science has always been done outwards from the love of the Bible yeah. to scientific exploration. Cause it takes faith and assumption to even, ask these scientific questions like you have to assume that there's laws of the universe for mathematical equations to work out and and that was rooted in this biblical worldview that there seems there's a lawgiver and there seems to be laws of the way things operate Mm -hmm. and so it's it was out of a worship of the creator to go discover more of what he made yeah yeah and so Man, they, science and the Bible are not are not enemies. They're not in conflict. Um, and the best lovers of the Bible and the best lovers of God have always excelled in science. Um, so, praise God. I'll praise pray. God. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Father, for for uh, how personal you are and for giving us the Bible and giving us great men of God like John Lennox. We just pray over him. We pray over James Tour. We pray over all of the people listening, Lord Jesus, that and, and watching on YouTube, Lord Jesus, that you will just touch them today through this episode, that you will uh, reveal your Holy Spirit to a greater extent to them, Lord Jesus, to show that they're you're accessible, you're personal, Lord Jesus, and your and your scriptures have very clear explanations of how we ought to live and who we are and, and why we're here, Lord Jesus. So God, will you fill us with purpose today? as we move through our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you for making it to the end of this episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to our channel. And if you want to give to the podcast, you can give at divinecreative.org, and that link will be in the bio and on our channel.